The American Civil War became the first war in which the railroad played a major role, and during that time, railroad lines in the state of North Carolina served the vital role of moving men and supplies for the Army of Northern Virginia. Prior to the Civil War, between 1860 and 1861, the rail lines were moving approximately 90,000 passengers annually. Between 1862 and 1865, over 500,000 passengers, mostly soldiers, rode the railway lines through the state. After the Civil War, North Carolina's network of train tracks was left almost completely decimated as the Union soldiers tore up tracks to disrupt goods and supply lines. This left an infrastructure that required extensive rebuilding and repairs. By the mid-1880s, new tracks were being laid, with almost 3,200 miles of new tracks laid between the years of 1881 and 1891. The new lines, along with the increase in train travel, led to enormous growth in mountain towns as tourism, farming, and industries took advantage of this transportation mechanism. In the western part of the state, the Western North Carolina Railroad, which later became the Southern Railroad, transformed the mountain region, and the railway lines in this area were a feat of engineering at the time. Built mainly by convict labor, tunnels were constructed, bridges were built, and tracks were laid. One of the branches on this line, called the Murphy Branch, was built between 1882 and 1891. This 123 miles of track stretched between Asheville and Murphy and included scaling Balsam Gap, which, at 3,351 feet, is the highest point east of the Rocky Mountains to be crossed by a standard gauge rail line. Such an endeavor was fraught with danger. In 1883, 19 inmates on a chain gang drowned when their ferry capsized, and they were buried in an unmarked grave beside the tracks. In 1885, 19 more laborers died from exposure when they became stranded in their work camp. After the tracks were completed, train accidents and death were not uncommon along the Murphy branch of the railroad. Despite the dangers of building and working on the railroad lines, the railway quickly opened up economic change in the region. At the highest point on the Murphy branch sat the small town of Balsam, which received its own train depot and became a favorite stop along the line. At the time, Balsam enjoyed four general stores, numerous churches, an Episcopal school, and the depot itself, at which passenger trains stopped six times a day. Many of these travelers were tourists seeking spectacular views or a retreat from urban life. Numerous other travelers were pursuing the perceived restorative qualities of the mountain air and the mineral springs which sat nearby. In order to accommodate the traveling public, the Balsam Springs Mountain Hotel was built by Joseph Kenny in 1908. Originally built with 107 rooms, the hotel was the largest summer resort hotel in Western Carolina, and tourists and locals would flock to this location for summer lodging or for community events. Promotional travel brochures touted the region's scenery and climate as a sharp contrast to that of city life. Upon approaching the hotel, guests were greeted by the sight of the double-tiered front porch, which allowed for dozens of rocking chairs for guests to enjoy. Inside, the spacious lobby occupied the entire front of the building and had two large fireplaces in the guest sitting areas. The hallways of the three-story hotel were designed to be eight foot wide in order to accommodate the large traveling trunks of the guests. Additionally, the 107 small bedrooms all had windows to allow for the mountain breezes to cool the rooms. A large dining area also allowed the guests to mingle and it allowed for community events to be held for the local citizens. The Balsam Springs Mountain Hotel reached its heyday in the 1920s and 30s, but as rail travel started to decline, the building changed hands and names several times after the Great Depression. At other points in its history, it was also a clinic for smallpox as well as a private residence. And while it has also been known as the Balsam Mountain Inn and the Balsam Hotel, it is now known today by the name The Grand Old Lady, and it is operating again as a hotel. Due to its historic past, the Grand Old Lady is also considered to be one of the most haunted locations in North Carolina. Soul Sisters Paranormal decided to travel to North Carolina to determine for ourselves if this stately and grand mountain hotel really is haunted.
Can you give us some kind of sign if you'd like a croissant? Or if you know who's been wanting a croissant? We'll take one of those bread bowls. Where do you keep the butter? Thank you. The Grand Old Lady Hotel is truly an awe-inspiring location when you approach it and it's easy to see why tourists would flock to this location. After learning the history and hearing paranormal reports, we were thrilled that we would be able to have the entire building to ourselves for the entire weekend. As such, the two Soul Sisters Paranormal Investigators, along with Miranda from Ghost Biker Explorations, were the only three people on the property for two full days. Upon our initial arrival, we were met by Candy from TLC Paranormal. She gave us a tour of the building, detailing several stories along the way. For example, room 205 is said to be inhabited by the spirit of Claude Green, a sheriff's deputy who was shot and killed in 1928. His body was said to have been brought to this room after he was shot. Also, a third floor hallway, known as Henry's Hall, is said to be active with footsteps, door slams, noises, and disembodied voices at all times during the night and day. Finally, we were given tours of the hallways, kitchen, and ballroom, all of which have reported paranormal activity. Although it was originally built with 107 rooms, currently the hotel has 50 guest rooms as many of the original smaller rooms were converted into larger rooms and suites. Each room is individualized and inviting, and to this day there are no TVs or phones in the rooms in order to maintain a rustic charm. One of the unique aspects of the Grand Old Lady is that it truly accepts and embraces its paranormal spirits and reported activity. The owner has hung a welcome sign over each room door in which a spirit is said to reside. After receiving our tour, we were given the keys to the hotel and left alone for the weekend. Miranda, as the ghost biker, conducted her investigation on the first night and captured some compelling evidence of paranormal activity. Encouraged by her investigation, Jenny and I started the second day of investigating by deciding where we would leave our stationary equipment that we would leave running throughout the night. Due to the numerous rooms and hallways, we wanted to cover as much area with our stationary equipment as we could. For example, we left a stationary night vision video camera and a voice recorder in the room where Sheriff Green is said to reside. We left the night vision video camera, a voice recorder, and a laser grid in Henry's hallway. We left the night vision video camera, a voice recorder, and a laser grid in the kitchen where the doors are said to open on their own and where the spirit of a former cook named Lizzie is said to reside. And finally, we left the night vision video camera, laser grid, and voice recorders in various rooms and hallways throughout the entire hotel. 
With our stationary equipment in place, Jenny and I started our investigation. During the night, we conducted EVP sessions throughout the hotel, spending time in various rooms, the hallways, the kitchen, and the dance hall areas. We also use various pieces of equipment, such as the REM pod and the Ovilus, in an attempt to communicate with any of the spirits of the hotel. One of the exciting aspects of our investigation of the Grand Old Lady Hotel was the fact that we believed that the spirits of the hotel were genuinely interested in communicating with us. Not once during our investigation did we feel like these spirits were malicious or threatening, but rather they wanted us to know that they were there. While we captured compelling evidence on our stationary equipment, we also captured what we believe were intelligent responses to our questions and actions. For example, numerous times in Henry's hallway, we heard knocks and bangs that seemed to be in response to what we were doing. We only know the story of one person, and that's the sheriff. But we'd like to tell your story We'd like to acknowledge you so that you can go into history books as well. Can you tell us your name? Thank you. Please come forward. We heard you. In another instance, while still in Henry's hallway on the third floor, Jenny and I heard a tremendous crash from the first floor. Believing that it was Miranda who caused the noise, we continued on with our investigation. After returning to our base camp, we discovered that Miranda thought it was actually Jenny and I who had caused the banging. While attempting to determine the cause of the noise, we discovered that a table had been overturned in a first floor bedroom. If you can see us, will you please knock on something? Miranda? Matthew, right? That right after we went upstairs, probably like two minutes after we went upstairs, did you drop something? No, but I heard something. That really and I thought you all dropped something. Because I was sitting there and I was wondering if I had well, damn. any walkie-talkies. That's yeah. what we said. I said, we got to get that girl walkie-talkie. I've got a set of four. I think we should use those because we thought that was you dropping something. But that wasn't you. It wasn't us. <laughs> that was me. Well, there's that. But I don't know if it was down or not. Because we never stepped into this room. Huh. Hmm. Well. Alright, continuing on with our quest. Do you want to see Miranda now? Let me get her? Yeah. Hey, Miranda. Would you mind stepping here for a sec? You, have, did you happen to look in any of these rooms here? Because there's a chair turned over here. You know, when I came through, when I came out there, I mean, it sounded when I came, I got through right here, and that's when it sounded like something. Well, this, this little table thing is overtur overturned. Something? Yeah. Just let me see how. I and mean, that's pretty sturdy. Just make sure. All 
All right, well, let's leave it there. If it falls over again. Is there a welcome sign here? No. No. But that definitely sounded like it. That did. Although we heard banging and knocks in the moment, our stationary voice recorder in Henry's hallway also captured bangs, knocks, slaps, and door slams when we were nowhere near the area. Although this went on for 13 hours, the following is a brief montage of some of those captured noises. In one instance, one of those bangs was coupled with an EVP of a male's voice. Henry's hallway was not the only location in which we captured intelligent responses. During the night, Jenny and I were walking in the second floor hallway when I asked, is there anybody down here? The voice recorder that was left in one of the rooms captured the following response. The kitchen of the Grand Old Lady Hotel also produced its share of compelling evidence during our investigation. At one point during the night, Jenny and I were conducting an EVP session when we captured the following EVP. <clears throat> Lizzie. Lizzie. Lizzie, are you with us tonight? Lizzie, are you with us tonight? Lizzie, are you with us tonight? At another point during the night, Jenny and I were leaving the kitchen when we thought we heard a noise. After pausing for a few seconds, the following EVP was captured on our stationary voice recorder just before we resumed walking. During the night, we had left the laser grid sitting on a secure base beside of our night vision video camera. 
About 45 minutes after we had left the area, for some unknown reason, the laser grid shifted on its own. After several hours of investigating on our own, during the last hours of our investigation, we were joined by Miranda. During that time, we conducted several experiments, such as Miranda's use of the dowsing rods, along with conducting EVP sessions and using the SLS camera and an EDI box in various rooms in the hotel. During one session in Henry's room, we captured some compelling footage on the SLS camera in conjunction with responses on the EDI box. Just turned on. Oh, that's a night light. Just turned on. I should probably turn off if I turn the light on. Why not? It may be motion sensor, but we didn't set it off because it didn't go off when no, I went in there. It didn't go off when you went in there. Can you turn that bathroom light off, please? Here, I'll turn mine off. I was about to growl. That was me. You turn yours off. Please. Whoa, 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 whoa. There you go. All right. All right, we got you. Were you the one that turned the bathroom light on? Can you turn it off? Are you sick? Whatever this thing is, it can't stand up. No. That was the same thing. Look. And you're on. Can you come back? Why'd you turn the bathroom light on? Can you turn it off? It's gone. Mm-hmm. Would you step back out? Please, I can see you. I mean, it was crawling. Last night when we were here, we got the word homicide. Were you hurt? Whoa. Homicide? Look, appeared. Every time you say it. Look at that. It's like it's hiding. It's, it's gonna be on the, it's gonna be right in front of the EDI box. It's touching the EDI box. Uh -huh. Is anything going on with the temperatures that changing? Temperature changing, it's touching the EDI box. 70.7. .7. Can you touch that and make that go to 71? Oh yeah, look at that, you're Thank changing you. the pressure. Thank nice. you. Nice. Thank you. Can you make that temperature go to 71 since you're touching it? You're almost look, there. Look, there's two. 71, please. Almost there. Come on. You're at 70.8. Just give it one big hit. I can... That that we saw was the temperature and the pressure. Sure, wasn't it? Look, there's two on there. All right, you're standing right in front of our, our special box. And you're doing a great job of changing the temperature. You're at 70.8. Can you take it to 71? Almost there. Come on. 70.9. Take it to 71 for us, please. You've just about got it. Touch it one more time. Look, there's two of them. One more time, please. Touch it one more time to, 70, to get it to 71. You can do it. It's not hurting you. It just lets us know you're here. Could you or your friend touch it? Since there's two of you here. He's going back to it. Yep, there, there you go. go. Thank you. Good. Look, he's actually touching it. Thank you. Christy, are you able to get the box in? Yep. You understand? Yep. That's crazy. You're actually you're actually touching. It. You're awesome. Seventy one, okay. thank you.
Returning to the kitchen with Miranda, we were conducting an EVP session when three things happened in quick succession. We captured an EVP, my camera shifted out of focus, and the iced tea maker turned on when we were told that it was not programmed to do so at that time. Thank you. After nearly 10 hours of investigating, we all decided to sleep for a couple of hours before sunrise. The three of us decided to sleep in a suite on the third floor adjacent to Henry's hallway. Miranda took the outer room while Jenny and I shared the interior room. Both Miranda and I had a voice recorder on the nightstand beside of our beds. While Miranda and I were deciding on if we should set an alarm or not, the following male's voice was captured in our conversation. Set the alarm for eight and see how we feel at eight. I don't think I'm gonna need an alarm. Set the alarm for eight and see how we feel at eight. I don't think I'm gonna need an alarm. Set the alarm for eight and see how we feel at eight. I don't think I'm gonna need an alarm. During the night, while we were all asleep, the voice recorder beside of my bed captured a bang, followed by a male's voice coming from Henry's hall. The final EVP is perhaps one of the best that we have ever captured. About 15 minutes after we had said our goodnights, the voice recorder beside of Miranda's bed captured a male's voice just outside of the bedroom door. We all heard this voice in the moment. Did y'all hear that? Yep. What did that sound like? Sound like a man's voice. That's what I thought. Nestled in the mountains of North Carolina sits a hotel that is unlike any other in the United States. Its original purpose was to welcome guests that made their way to Balsam via the railroad. But through the years, the hallways and rooms of this stately building witness the highs and lows that come with the ebb and flow of the tourism industry. The town of Balsam itself also lost its original grandeur after the trains were replaced with automobiles. Today, however, this elegant three-story hotel has once again returned to its intended purpose. But while this majestic building beckons travelers to experience a simpler time before the days of televisions and cell phones, it also accommodates those spirits who wish to forever remain permanent guests at the Grand Old Lady Hotel. <laughs>